Well, that was a really nice introduction, so thank you, Doug. I always feel a little funny, though, because most of the time I, when I'm introduced, somehow it comes up, well, Jill went and she followed, she, she, she went with her husband, she left everything, she started a church with him, and I always feel a little bad when that story is told because it makes me sound really good, but if I'm being really honest, I, in that season, 14 years ago, 15 years ago when we did that, I'm, I'm, I went with a bad attitude at the time. Like I wasn't, um, yeah, I went with a bad attitude. So the message before the message here is you can obey God even with a bad attitude and he'll do something awesome with it. I have to say this is a very surreal moment for me to be here tonight, which, first of all, I heard that this group is the Rowdy Six, so I'm going to need you to be a little rowdy because I have the kind of voice, and you'll see as we go on, that can kind of lull you to sleep. I made the mistake the first round of saying it was like the lady you hear late at night on the radio. Not good, didn't mean that, but you got to be a little rowdy, okay, so that we can all have fun together, but I, um, I never saw this moment 15 years ago. I honestly, this is a surreal moment, and when the church started, I can remember a woman. I was in charge of kids' church because I was one of the only ones with children at the time, so that's just what I did, and I remember a lady came to the church, and she said, you know, as she's dropping her kids off, she said, you know, I this church one day I really think is going to reach a lot of people and it's going to grow and and it's going to become something that I think will surprise you. And yeah, she was right. I remember thinking, I don't see that at all. Like, I am crazy surprised about what God has done. And so it's just a really special moment to be here with you. You have some amazing pastors and Pastor Doug and Sam and Ethan and Steph and Ryan. They are just, you know what I has been so fascinating to me is that a large part of this church is made up of people who said, you know what, Doug and Sam and Ryan and Steph and Ethan, you're leaving everything comfortable and familiar, but we're going to do that too because we so believe in the God who's called you and in the God who's called us, and we so love you as individuals that we're going to leave everything familiar and comfortable, and we're going to go too, and I love that. This is a bold, courageous group of people, and I'm telling you guys, this city is is about to see Jesus and he's already they're already seeing Jesus but in such a beautiful powerful way through you and that is exciting there is beauty on the other side of obedience whether you do it with a good attitude or a bad one it's exciting I love your pastors Doug said that uh, we lived together that also sounds weird we Doug, Sam, they moved in, Luna, they moved in, it would have been a year ago last May, and it was really fun, and what they have no idea at the time, we were, right, uh, goodness, we had, we were stepping into a really hard season in our family's life personally, we were right in the middle of it, they had no idea when they moved in, but with them, they just brought a pure joy They just had a pure joy that was so refreshing, so good for us in that season. They had no idea. Part of that joy came with their dog, Luna. So they moved in with their dog. We have three boys, three, two teenagers and one 10-year-old. You'll see them in a minute. But they moved in with their dog, Luna. We have a dog, three smelly boys. My brother and his wife got a puppy, an eight-week-old puppy, and then decided to go on vacation for three weeks. So guess who took their puppy? We did. We thought, why not? We've already got doggy daycare going on. Let's bring in a puppy. Plus, we had our neighbors who had a puppy golden retriever named Kevin, who he just liked to come over and enjoy the party too every once in a while. And so the boys would leave the door open, and I'm telling you, the back door. So Kevin would just come in. Once he came right in, took a toy of Luna's, left with Luna's toy. Luna kind of was like, what happened? I guess I don't, I'm not going to get my toy back. We'll just let the dog have it. Another time, 
Kevin runs in, runs under a chair, flips the chair. Sam and I are watching as all this is, is unfolding. Flips the chair, starts peeing everywhere. It was just pandemonium chaos. And I, in that moment, I thought, I can't. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. I, can, I, I can't, God. I can do people, fill my house with people. I don't know if I can have a house full of dogs. But it was, it was fun. Fine. Final Luna story. I love, love, love sweets. Love, love, love cheesecake. Well, right before the the Weckermans moved here, Luna decided, you know what? I'm going to leave a lasting impression. As I'm eating my cheesecake one night, she runs in, takes a bite, runs upstairs, puts herself to bed. I thought, no way. She just took my cheesecake. That is not cool, but I ate it anyway because that's just what you do. I've heard dog mouths are cleaner than humans, so we just went with it, right? But no, I, it's, it's, it's an honor for me to be here. I'm so excited. What I love about this group, all of you, like this church is for the most part brand new, right? You've been here since January, long before that, with all the prayers and the, and, and the time that's gone into preparing for today. But you are all at this brand new place, this new season in your life as, as a church family, as an individual. You are at a place where, my goodness, the opportunities are endless, the opportunities to influence you ex- at an exciting place of new beginnings and fresh starts. And there's just, there's just a cool readiness that comes with that. This week, I watched my boys. You'll see a picture of my boys here in a minute. They went to school. School starts. And I watched as much as they grumble and complain about school, I also watched them. They were excited because something new is starting in their lives. And so, let's see, maybe you'll see a picture come up. If you do, oh, there they are. Okay, so we've got Ethan on the end. You guys, I think some of you may have had a chance to meet him. You were awesome to him two months ago. Thanks for being so good to him. Ashton in the middle and Austin. So that's our, our life, our boys, 16, 14, 10, a lot of fun. So, you know, here they are. They're getting ready for school. They're excited. I, again, that whole piece of there's something fun about clean Uh, Clean slates, fresh starts. My youngest, he needed a clean slate. He is the kid that um, we say he's, he's got quick wit, lots of sass, like his dad, like his Aunt Lori, who is, uh, some of you know her here, she's here, and and man, this kid, he said to me the other day, he goes, you know, mom, my teacher last year, he was just fun to watch when he got mad, so sometimes I'd just say things on purpose to get him mad because it was just fun to see what would happen, and I thought, Ashton, you need a fresh start. That can't happen again this year, not happening, so we'll see. We're only day, we we just finished day two, so we'll see how it goes, but I I love that fresh starts, new beginnings are fun, and so you might be in here tonight where you say, you know what, I'm at a new place in my journey, I'm in a new place in my journey with God, I'm in a new place, a new city, I'm, I'm, there's just so many opportunities for me, but with that also can come some uncertainty and worry and fear, and so I thought, well, what, what, what do I have to bring here tonight What could I share? And it honestly reminded me of a season when I was asked to do something that I'd never done before. And the ask was a hard, it was was hard for me to actually step into this area and to do it. And so I took a moment where I was just, our family was on vacation and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and just pray and say, God help is here I am, I've been asked to do something that I'm really kind of terrified to do, and I'm not sure where to go from here. And so as I'm outside praying this one morning, and I just, I like being outside when I pray. For whatever reason, I feel closer to God. As I was outside, I saw an airplane in the sky. And the airplane started riding something. You're going to see a picture here in a minute. Now, it's kind of hazy because it took me a while to get out my phone. I had to find my phone, but it said, trust Jesus. And I thought, well, that's cool. Here we are. I'm asking God, what do I do in this moment? And God's like literally writing it in the sky. (laughs) Have you ever prayed like, Lord, just write it on the wall. Tell me, please. And I thought, that's really happening. Well, then I was so mesmerized by this. I kept watching. And then this happened. 
J-I. I thought, it is going to say Jill trusts Jesus. How is that possible? So I ran in and I got Sean and Sean, check this out. Like, I think God is writing in the sky for me right now. And he rolled his eyes and said, yeah, right, whatever. It didn't end up saying trust Jesus. It said Jesus loves me in the end. But in that moment, it could have said Jill trust Jesus. That's what it said to me. And so that's where tonight I thought, you know what? If I could bring anything to you as a group of people, wherever you are in your journey, whether you are investigating, what is this? What, what is this that I feel when I come to this church and come to this place? What is that? Or if you are here and you say, you know what? I'm, I'm brand new to, my, to, to having a relationship with God. Or you're, wherever you are at in your journey, I just want to come tonight and say my hope is that as you hear me share that you would go, yep, you know what? I can. I can trust Jesus. I can do that. But how? How do we get to that place? And so I was actually, and before though I go on, I, I did miss, miss a moment here, that whole message of Trusting in Jesus, it's actually quite simple, right? It's not a very profound message. You've probably come and you're like, well, I was hoping to hear something really cool, but she's going to say the churchy thing, trust Jesus. And that's actually, that, that churchy language, that's not my heart for tonight. Like, my heart for tonight is that you would just be inspired to get as close to Jesus as you possibly can. Because one thing I can promise you, getting close to Jesus is so worth it. It's so worth it. And so that's why I thought, well, you know what? It's a simple message. It's not easy to do to trust God. But I did, when I was entertaining the idea of throwing this whole message out, I came across this. And so I said, you know what? Nope, this is where we're going. Lisa Bevere, best-selling author, wrote this. You may say it's all too simple. Human nature is often drawn to the difficult and complex, but I find God most often in the pure and in the simple. And so tonight, I'm going to begin to tell you a few stories that'll give you a little glimpse into who I am as a person, a little glimpse into my world, and my hope is, again, that you would just lean in and listen, because I know this room is full of people who have experienced great hurt, great loss, great pain, all kinds, and it's created all kinds of uncertainty and confusion, and to that, I would just say, man, I'm sorry. I hate that. I hate, I hate that you have been hurt by whomever, whatever, but my hope is that as you listen tonight, you would just become curious, more curious, okay, well, if God would do that in her life, what would he do in mine? My hope is that you would become determined to get as close to Jesus as you possibly can, be determined to pray specific prayers and say, okay, God, what, what do you want to do in my life, through my life? And so I, and, and I, I'm not telling you all these stories just because I want to talk about myself. No, not at all. Actually, I, I don't enjoy talking about myself, but my inspiration came from Acts 22, In Acts 22, and we'll look at it a little later, there's uh, a man named Paul who became one of the greatest apostles of all time, and he wrote the majority of the books in the Bible. And what I noticed about Paul, that, you know, he for a long time lived his life persecuting those who had faith in Jesus. That was just what he did. And for a long time, he, he spent his all his energy killing those who believed in Christ. And so, but at one point, God got a hold of his life in a powerful, mighty way. And after that, after that dramatic encounter with Jesus, he decided to take his story, to take his life, to take his past, to take his present, and to take everything that God had done. And he said, you know what? I'm going to share what God's done with an audience of one. I'm going to share what God has done with an audience of many. I'm just going to share it. And he did that 
because he wanted to take his life and he wanted to point people to Jesus with it. He wanted to help people grow in their ability to believe in and to trust God. And so that's why I thought, okay, I'm going to share a few stories that just highlight the goodness of God. It's all I have for you tonight. That's it. I just want to highlight the goodness of God to inspire you to go, okay, God, I've got my own stories that you will use for this city. So we'll start when I was little, seven years old. That's basically, I went, to, that's, that's the moment for me when I said, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And, and actually, it wasn't even my idea. I went to a Bible, a vacation Bible school with a friend, and it was one summer, and they gave the whole, if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, Savior, raise your hand, come forward, give your heart to Jesus. Well, I didn't want to go because I just didn't, I didn't want to raise my hand. I was too shy and afraid to, to walk the walk of shame because you had to walk up to the front at that time. And I did not want with all my little seven-year-old sins walking in front of all these people. But my friend sitting next to me, her name was Sarah, she said, Jill, I want to give my heart to Jesus. Come with me. Let's go do it. Let's go do it. And so I am somewhat of a people pleaser. So I said, okay, I'll go do it. And so there again, Obey with a bad attitude, and you just don't know what God will do, right? So I go forward. I um, didn't really fully obviously understand. I was seven, but I know that from there, God just kept his hand on my life. And, and so now we're going to fast forward to college, college years, went to school, got into a relationship with a guy that I just, I loved him, but I knew it was not a good, healthy relationship. I knew it was one I shouldn't have been in, but for whatever reason, man, I loved this guy, and I just had a really hard time getting out of it. But again, I just knew inside my heart that it wasn't good for me, and I actually a couple times tried to break up with the guy, and he said no, which... What? Who does that? He said, no. And I said, okay, girl, if you break up with a guy, break up with a guy. Walk away. Don't say, don't let him talk you into whatever, okay? Just whatever. Okay. So anyway, I, I stayed in this relationship far too long, but one weekend I went home. It was fall break. Went home to my parents. And again, I feel closest to God when I'm outside. So I went out into their backyard and I just prayed a simple, simple prayer. I said, God, you know what? This relationship doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right, but I cannot get out of it. So if I need to be out, God, I need you to do it. You have to get me out. I went back to school after that weekend. The first time I saw the guy after, after being gone for the weekend, he broke up with me. I was like, what? That is the fastest prayer I have ever prayed. Why doesn't God do that all the time? He just, I wish he would, but anyway. I, I just knew. I was like, oh my goodness, God, this is a God moment, God's story. He heard my prayer and he answered it in that moment. We fast forward. Now I am a senior in college, time to graduate. Where do I go, right? You're at this place of opportunities are endless. I could go anywhere. And I really wanted to stay in Minneapolis because that's where I went to college. A lot of friends had another boyfriend, which I'm making myself sound really boy crazy, but I kind of was. And so I, I, that's where I wanted to stay. But I was trying to get a job and it just wasn't happening for me there. And it happened in my one, one morning, quiet time, I came across this verse and I wanted to share it with all of you because I thought, well, man, maybe there's somebody in here that can take this verse and you feel like you're standing at a crossroads. And you know, my heart in that moment, I'll read it to you in a minute, but my heart in that moment was, I just wanted to be in the center of God's will. I would say that all the time which I've learned the center of God's will, honestly, is just being in relationship with him. That's it. We make God's will to be this writing in the sky type moment where we need to know exactly where he wants us. But if I could just tell you, it's, it, it's simpler than that. It's just saying, Jesus, my relationship with you is the center of your will. And then he moves you and places you and puts you all along the way where he wants you. So I found this verse and I just started praying it as I would go in my quiet times each day. I would, I would say, God, 
I cling to your commands and I follow them as closely as I can. Lord, don't let me make a mess of things. If you will only help me to want your will, then I will follow your laws even more closely. Just tell me what to do and I will do it, Lord. As long as I live, I'll wholeheartedly obey. Make me walk along the right paths, for I know how delightful they really are. And so I'd pray that day after day after day. Probably not every day because I wasn't that good. I didn't pray like every day. But I, I would try when, when I was having those moments of just me and God, that's what I would cling to. And so as I said, here I am in Minneapolis not getting a job. So I thought, well, it's just I'm going to move home. And I had a professor in home at that time was Cleveland, Ohio. That's where I grew up. And I had a professor say to me, well, why don't you see there's a school Christian school in Rockford, Illinois. Why don't you see? They have a great school, great church, lots of young people. I think you'd really thrive there. Why don't you see if they have a job available? I applied for a job there. I'm sorry. I called the school. They said, nope, sorry, no jobs. But as I was driving from my Minneapolis to Ohio, I pulled off the interstate. Rockford happens to be right off the interstate. Show up at the school, and they, I, I say, I'm here to pick up an application. And they said, well, huh, funny enough, a teacher just called us this morning and said that she's not returning in the fall. She's having twins, so she's not coming back. Do you want to interview? I thought, well, yeah, absolutely. So I interviewed. They hired me on the spot. I moved there. They, had, they already had roommates for me. They had other teachers, that girl teachers that needed a roommate. So it was just like God just did it. I met my husband there, and rest is history, right? So we, 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 um, we meet, we get married. Fast forward now 19 years, marriage. The fact that we made it 19 years and still going sometimes. There's, there's a bunch of God stories in there that make those miracles, make it a miracle that here we are today. But uh, one year ago, big, big... Um, moment for my for our family one of the hardest seasons probably ever that Sean and I as parents have had to navigate um one year ago this month actually our oldest son Ethan he went on a missions trip to Africa he came home he'd been home for 10 days and st- woke up one morning with what we thought was just a flu virus and the virus lasted about 10 days and By that day three, we found ourselves in the hospital, um, ICU. He spent five days in the ICU, almost uh, could have lost his life. It was, he went into septic shock twice. There was a moment where his body, his whole body was filling with fluid, fluid on, they didn't know if he's got fluid on the brain, but he's, he's, potentially going into respiratory failure. It was such a a scary, hard, hard season for us. And I remember day five, as we're in the hospital, they're running all kinds of tests. We can't, they don't know. They can't find it. They can't figure out what's going on. And I remember saying to one of Ethan's nurses, you know what, this thing that he's fighting, it just feels like it's toying with us because he'll, he'll be okay, he'll be, he'll be stable, and then he'll just crash. And then he'll come back up and he'll be okay, he'll be stable, and then he'll just crash, and I don't get it. It's just we are on such an emotional roller coaster with this thing, and I'm just, this is hard. Well, that day, a, um, a couple from our church came to the hospital, and it, we actually, in that moment, had asked for no more visitors because we had had uh, many wonderful people coming and wanting to be there for us. And, but this, in this moment, we were just feeling tired and exhausted, so we had asked for no more visitors. And so I remember the nurses came to us, and they said, there's a couple here. Their names are... Sai and Melissa, and they've asked if they could come see you. And I really thought Sean would send them away because we had just had a bunch of family there. And um, But s- surprisingly to me, he said, no, they, they can come back. So Sai and Melissa came back, and Sai said to us, he said, you know what, I feel like God asked me to come and to pray for your son. But we knew you had asked for no visitors, so we were kind of like, God, why would you want us to go pray for them. They, they don't want any visitors. But we thought, no, we're going to obey. We're going to go. And if they let us in, awesome. If they don't, then we can just pray for Ethan out in the lobby. 
And so they said, but we're here, so can we pray for your son? And we said, yes, please. And I will never forget Sai's prayer. He put his hand on my son, and he began to pray. And he first started to say things like, Ethan, you are a mighty warrior, which I was just wide-eyed in that moment because unbeknownst to Sai, Ethan's name in Hebrew means mighty warrior. And I thought, well, how cool. How, how does he know that? He didn't. Then the prayer gets even more interesting. He starts to say things like, he starts to speak specifically to the bacteria in Ethan's body. He said, and I'll never forget, he said, bacteria, you have been playing with us for far too long. Those were his exact words. Just that morning I said I felt like I'd been toyed with by this bacteria. He said, bacteria, you've been playing with us for too long. You have been hiding from us, and you cannot hide any longer. You need to raise your hand. You need to tell us who you are in Jesus' name. And I remember thinking, whoa, like that was the weirdest prayer. <laughs> but I'll take it. Like, okay, I take it. And, and little side note here. When you pray... You have permission to be specific. You can be specific with your prayers. You can speak directly and specifically to whatever issue it is you're fighting or up against, and you can tell it no in the name of Jesus. You have that permission. And I believe with all my heart that in that moment, the Holy Spirit whispered the words into Sai's heart and into his mind, into his mouth. Because an hour after he left, the doctors came in and they said, you're not going to believe this, but you know, um, protocol when testing for malaria says you run three tests. Well, as you know, this morning we told you your son does not have malaria because the first two tests came back negative. But we just found malaria in that third test. And they said it was as if the bacteria was hiding from us. Those were his exact words. Sai had just prayed. He had just said, you can't hide from us. The doctors, out of their mouth, said it was as if the bacteria was hiding from us. They said, in fact, it was so difficult to find, it was in one little red blood cell that was at the top of the, the, the screen, almost off the screen entirely. We went down and we thanked the technicians ourselves for finding this. They went on to say that finding this bacteria was like finding a needle in a haystack. Wow. They found it. They identified it. They started to attack it specifically, and we were home two days later. That was one year ago on Friday of this last week, just this last Friday. Yeah. you're sitting in here and thinking, okay, why are you sharing all these stories with us? Like, why? Is it to brag? Not on me, no. It's to brag on God. You guys, God is big. He's big and he's good. And he has story after story upon story for every single one of you. In fact, I enjoyed listening, talking to some of you, hearing your stories of how you landed here today. God is so good. Things, he does things that we cannot plan, right? That we can't plan ourselves, that we can't manufacture. That's who he is. Write the stories down as they come so that you'll always remember and that you will get to share them. Because this world, the people in your world, your school, your work, your neighbors, they need to hear your God stories. As I was reading Acts 22 and, and, and about Paul and how he is sharing his stories with, with the different audiences, something jumped out at me that I'd never seen before. Right after Paul's first encounter with God, his dramatic encounter with Jesus. So right, he's at this place of new beginning. He's at his fresh start. There's a man that enters his life, and that man's name is Ananias. 
And when Ananias came into Paul's story in that moment, he looked at Paul and he said, you need to tell people what God has done. And he said, you need to take all of your stories, all of it, and use it for God's good. Use it for his glory. Use it for the good of others. And so I want to read that verse to you tonight. It's Acts 22, 14 through 16. It says, the God of our ancestors has handpicked you to be briefed on his plan of action. You've actually seen the righteous innocent, and you've heard him speak. You are to be a key witness to everyone you meet of what you've seen and heard. He's saying, tell your story. Tell your stories, your God stories. So what are you waiting for, he asked. Get up. Get yourself baptized, scrub clean of those sins, and personally acquainted with God. And I thought, you know what? How cool. I want to come alongside you, all of you right now here in this room, in this moment. I want to come alongside you as like a lady version of Ananias, okay? I just want to say, God has handpicked you, every single one of you. You have been handpicked by God. Handpicked. So what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? This is your moment. Get yourself personally acquainted with God. Get yourself personally acquainted with God. And again, I don't want you, as you listen, I don't want you to be discouraged by my stories and look at me and say, well, she's perfect. Ah, she's, she's lived this perfect life of prayer. She's made perfect choices and decisions and that couldn't be farther from the truth. Like, I'm just not perfect. I, I'm i not. I, a lot of times, I have great intentions, you know, and I, I do do my best to get up in the morning and to go out and spend some time with God. But there are mornings when my words just fall short and I don't have them. And I just sit and I stare at the sky. That's it. <laughs> but the one common denominator, if I would look over the course of, you know, my, my life, the one common denominator is that I simply um, decided that I'm going to get personally acquainted with God and I'm not going anywhere. I can remember the night, um, one night when we were in the hospital with Ethan and he was at the height of his sickness and I can remember going into the bathroom and just bawling and it was like one in the morning and we had no idea what's going to be the long-term effect with our son. But I can remember saying, you know what, God, I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be. I have no idea. But, God, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. And I feel like if there's one bit of encouragement that I could give to you, if you would just say, okay, God, I'm going to every day do my best to get acquainted with you, and I'm not going anywhere. This life with Jesus, it's like a a slow, steady pace of just getting to know him every day, every day, every day, one day at a time. And I actually wrote this, and I thought I'd love to read it to you, and I wrote it down because I just didn't want to forget any of the words, and I thought I might forget. But if I could just say this to you as an encouragement, life is a journey. It's slow, steady. God journeys it with us, and sometimes we'll see the big, dramatic miracle moments. But more often than that, as you look back, you'll see that it was his steady, immovable hand that made the greatest impact. There have been constant, never-ceasing glimpses of him and his faithfulness. Quite possibly the greatest miracle in my personal story has just been one of consistency. Somehow I managed to stay consistent. That's it slow and steady pace of putting myself in a place of saying, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I kind of, I resolved to remain. If I could encourage you, resolve to remain. It's so, so worth it. You will not be disappointed by just saying, God, here I am every day. Here I am. Get to know God's character. Like, that is how you want your trust in him to grow and and to be strengthened. The only way you will do that, the best way you will do that, 
be able to trust him is by getting to know his character because it's in getting to know his character that you'll see, wow, he really does care. He sees me. I matter. You'll see he's so full of compassion. And I had somebody ask me once, they said, okay, well, you know what? I want to get into the Bible. I want to investigate and look at his promises, but how do I know which promises are for me? Because there's so many promises and sometimes, you know, like he promised Abraham and Sarah that they'd have a baby in their old age and like, I can't, how can I hold on to that promise? And I had to laugh because I thought, you know what? I have, I've wondered that question too. Which promises are for me and which promises are are for just the Bible character in that moment because I have prayed that prayer. God, give me an old, like, give me a baby in my old age because I love babies. Sean would be so upset if he knew I prayed that prayer <laughs> as often as I pray it. <laughs> no. But I don't know that that one's for me. I mean, I don't know. But here's what I know and here's what I can encourage you with is this. When you get into the word and you look at God at promises, you find promises that speak to the character of God, who he is. You find those promises that depict his character and who he is. And those are the promises that you know you can hang onto for you with white fisted knuckles. God has so many stories of faithfulness for you that he wants to use for this world. He adores you. He loves you. And if I could, I I know, I'm guessing that everyone in here, again, we want to live this life in a close connection with Jesus. We want to live this life that matters. We want to live this life of perfect purpose, but sometimes it just feels so overwhelming. Like, how do I do that really well? And if I could just say to you, it's in that place of getting acquainted with Jesus because it's in that place that as you're choosing every day to do your life with him, you'll live your life as his child, reflecting him him reflecting who he is and you'll just live life as normal and look back one day and go oh my goodness God was working purpose in my life all along like God was doing it God was using me all along that's what it looks like to live your life with Jesus. And so I just want to, I'm about to close here. I've been talking for a long time and I'm gonna close and I want to read one more time just the verse in Acts. And as I read it, it's, I'm reading it as it, as if I just am speaking it in a way that it's like a little seed and I hope that it gets planted in your heart, in your spirit, that you take it with you so that you believe it for yourself because, my goodness, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. You will not be disappointed if you just choose to say, here I am, God. Here I am. Use me. He loves you so much. And, you know, the the best I have to bring here today, the best I have to offer is my love for Jesus. I just love him. I love him, and I hope that some of that spills off of me over onto you, and it just makes you go, you know what? She's not perfect, but I want to love Jesus like that. I want to get as close to Jesus as I possibly can, so I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to pray for all of us. God of our ancestors has handpicked you to be briefed on his plan of action. You've actually seen the righteous innocent and you've heard him speak. You are to be a key witness to everyone you meet of what you've seen and heard. So what are you waiting for? Get up, get yourself baptized, scrubbed clean of those sins and personally acquainted with God. God has handpicked you. He's handpicked you. And maybe you've seen some of his stories of his faithfulness awesome. Maybe you feel like you haven't. If you have, write those stories down. And if you haven't, say, okay, God, here I am. I want to start seeing. I want to start seeing you involved in my life and I want to share it. What are you waiting for? Again, you're in an amazing city. I love this city. I even love the heat, you guys. Like I'm cold all the time and I have been outside here as much as I can because it feels so good but this is an amazing city and they need you 
They need the Jesus inside of you. That's what they need. And I believe with all my heart, like this room is power packed with people who've said, we're gonna leave the comfortable and familiar so that we can help other people. Oh, what a beautiful place. What a beautiful position to be in. That's who you are. And I can't wait to come back in another year. Hopefully I'll be back before that. But to see, whoa, what God's done with a group of people who have just said, okay, God, we're getting acquainted with you. We're not quitting. We're ready. We're going. Now, some of you say, there might be some of you in here that you go, you know what? Um, that verse talked about scrubbing yourself clean of sin. And I, I've not made that decision to actually allow Jesus to do that for me yet. And so we're going to close and we're going to pray and you'll have the invitation to accept um, him as Lord, Savior, accept his ability to scrub you clean. That invitation will be given. But before we get to that place of praying, I just want to say to you this one last thing. Simply, quite simply, trusting Jesus looks like this. It looks like every day saying, okay, God, here I am. Take this. Take this that I'm working through. Take this that I'm uh, navigating. Take me. Here I am. I cast my care upon you because I know you care for me. And it's a matter of just every day, every day, one day at a time, one beautiful, one hard, one great, one not so great day at a time of saying, Jesus, here I am. Take me, use me, and I cast my care upon you because I know you care. So let's pray. I want to pray for all of you, if I could. And um, as we close, though, if just to be sensitive to the friends around us, if you would close your eyes, um, bow heads, and I would like to ask, is there anyone here you say, you know what, I've been hearing you talk about Jesus, I've been investigating for a little while, uh, I think today is the day that I want to say, I want you, Lord, as my Savior. I want to live my life with you. If that's you, the invitation is for you now to just raise your hand and say, here I am, God. Is there anyone in here? Okay, well, awesome. We all, we all are at a place of, I'm guessing, saying, Lord, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready to go. I know this is a group that's saying, we, we aren't waiting anymore. We're going we're gonna to do our best to get as close to Jesus as we can, and we're going to take it to this city. So if you would be uh, so kind as to let me, to let me pray, I'm going to pray for you, and then we'll worship together. So Father God, I thank you for this amazing group of individuals, this group of people who has said, Lord, here I am. I want to obey you. Lord God, you're so good. You're so good, and I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this place. I pray that you would light a fire in the hearts of every single person in this place. I pray, God, that this city would see Jesus in every single one of them. I pray that this city would be drawn to Jesus, and I pray, God, that we would just make a lasting difference and impact in this world because, God, we know, we know that one day you're coming back for us. Like this isn't our home. This isn't our place uh, that you ever intended for us. And so, Father, I pray that we would use our lives to just share the hope with as many people as we possibly can. And I pray that you would infuse this beautiful group of people with joy and excitement and passion. And I pray that as they say, yes, God, here we are, 
to get to know you every day, I pray, God, that they would not be disappointed, that every day they would learn a little bit more of your character and who you are, and that would give them what they need to get through to the next day and the next and the next and the next. I pray for consistency over this group, God. Consistency, tenacity. I thank you, God. I love you. We love you so much, and it's our honor now to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.